All right, welcome back everybody. And today we're going to be using some complex analysis to solve the Basel problem. So this is a video I've been wanting to do for quite some time now, and I've finally gotten around to doing it. So this is going to be quite an exciting journey ahead of us. Um, as you can see from the length of this video, it's going to be quite a long journey. So if you want to watch through the whole thing, you might want to pause the video right here. Go grab a couple of snacks or a drink or something and um, enjoy the video. So let's just jump straight into it. What is the Basel problem? It's pretty much just the sum of the reciprocals of all these squares right here over the natural numbers, of course, because we're going from k equals one all the way up to infinity. So this is equal to one plus a quarter plus a ninth plus a sixteenth plus dot 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 and it keeps going like that and we want to show that this infinite sum is equal to pi squared over six and um, there's a lot of ways to do this there's the method using Fourier series which is quite common there's the method that Euler used which uses the infinite product for the sign there's a lot of methods but the method I want to use today is complex analysis because that's kind of the ongoing theme of this channel so let's just start with a chapter one right here so chapter one and um, this chapter is just going to be a bit of a motivation. So how do we want to go about solving this thing? So motivation. Okay. So in complex analysis, we have this nice relationship between contour integration and summation using the Cauchy's residue theorem. So if you have the Cauchy's residue theorem, it says that if you have some kind of contour around some closed loop, it's equal to the sum of all the residues inside of that contour. And usually when we evaluate um, integrals, we usually try to form some kinds of contour integral, and then we use the sum of the residues to evaluate it. But in this case, we have a sum. So in this video, what we want to do is we want to kind of go from a sum back to an integral. And in order to do that, notice that we have a sum of the residues and right here we have the sum of one over k squared. We want to interpret that our goal um, is to interpret one over k squared as some kind of a residue. So as some kind of residue. And what kind of residue do we want this to be? Well, notice that k is going from one to infinity. So it's counting through all the natural numbers. So we want this to be a residue at the natural numbers. That would make it quite nice. So um, interpret one over k squared at, as a residue at the positive integers. I'll write it like that. And we actually want to kind of generalize this to not only the positive integers, but all the integers, but we're going to exclude zero and we'll see why um, later. And I guess if you want to know why right now, if you plug zero into this case where what you're going to get infinity, which isn't quite nice. So we're just excluding zero for now. And if we can interpret one over k squared as, as some kind of a residue of a function, so I guess I should write of some function f of z, then we can use contour integration to find out what the value of that residue is. And that's going to help us find out what the sum of one over k squared is equal to. So that's kind of the idea. So what, what does this look like in terms of a picture? Well, if this is the complex plane right here, so if we have the residues at the integers, that, that means we have poles at the integers. So whatever function we choose, we want that function to have poles at the integers like so. I'll just mark these in red. And what we want to do is we want to construct some kind of contour around this, which encloses all of these poles right here. And the contour we're actually going to be using is a square, um, as strange as it might seem. Usually we're dealing with circles and semicircles, um, which are quite nice in the complex plane. But we're actually dealing with a square in this case. And the reason why is simply because a square is a lot nicer to use in this case than a circle. I've tried it with a circle and um, things just don't work out nicely. So let's call this square SN and we'll um, describe SN later in the video. And right away you can see that if we have the contour integral over Sn of whatever function this is, so let's say it's f of z dz, this is equal to the sum of the residues inside of this contour. So the residues of f of z. And we know, at least for the integers excluding zero, that we're going to get some kind of um, one over k squared. So in fact, 
we can obtain a, a sum of 1 over k squared from this residue. And this square, we're going to be taking the limit as our n approaches infinity because we want our square. You can imagine this as like a net that keeps growing and growing. We want to be able to catch more and more poles. Um, and that's just so when we sum all these residues, we're summing infinitely many residues. And when we translate this over to being 1 over k squared, we're summing from k equals 1 to infinity. And that's how we can make this relationship between the Basel problem, which is what we have right here, and this contour integral. And we're going to be showing, in fact, that this contour integral goes to zero, and that's going to help us out quite a bit. So this is the basic idea of what we're going to be doing um, in this video. So that's chapter one then. That's, that's the basic idea. We're going to be moving on to Chapter 2 now. Chapter 2 is going to be finding f of z. So we want to find some f of z so that it actually works for us and we can get 1 over k squared as a residue. So let's try to find some kind of function f of z. What are the conditions we need on f of z? Well, notice right here that we want poles at the integers. So we want some kind of function that has a pole or has a singularity at the integers. And a nice function that kind of does that periodically, because we want poles on the real axis in a periodic nature, a nice function that does that is the cotangent function. So the cotangent, let's just choose a complex variable z, because at least on the real plane, whenever you have a cotangent of x, for example, you're going to have asymptotes. I'll just draw a quick graph over here. You're going to have asymptotes at every single integer multiple of pi. So we're going to be doing something like this. So asymptotes every single integer of pi. But that's not quite what we want. We want asymptotes at the integers. So we kind of have to rescale this a little bit while multiplying it by pi. So by doing so, when z is an integer, inside of the cotangent, we get an integer multiple of pi, which means that we're going to get an asymptote, which means our function is undefined, which is quite nice. So in fact, the cotangent of pi z is a function which has poles at the integers. Okay, so how does this help us out right here? Well, let's just try to evaluate the residue of this thing because at the end, we want, a f we want to find a function where the residue is one over k squared, where k is an integer. So let's just find the residue of this thing. So the residue, at z equals to k, where k is an integer. So I'll just write it right here, where k is an integer. And just to be clear, um, an integer without zero. So how do we find the residue of this thing right here? Well, it's not too bad to do. We just use the definition of the residue for simple poles, because the poles of this um, function right here, this cotangent, are in fact a simple poles. And you can confirm that for yourself by rewriting this cotangent as a cosine over sine, and if you differentiate this sine at the bottom right here that's causing problems, you won't be blowing up at the integers. So that's a quick way to check with the derivative. So the residue of this cotangent, that's the limit as z approaches k of z minus the pole, so z minus k, times our function right here. And I'm gonna rewrite cotangent as cosine of pi z over the sine of pi z. Very nice, and where can we go from here? Well, this is just a limit we need to evaluate, but notice that when z approaches k, this factor at the front right here, that turns into a zero, but also notice that when we have an integer multiple of pi instead of the sine, the sine is equal to zero, and k is an integer, which means that when z approaches some integer k, we're going to get an integer multiple of pi instead of the sine, which means sine is equal to zero. So in fact, right here, we have a little bit of a problem. We have a zero divided by zero situation, which means we can use a little bit of L'Hopital. And of course, for this cosine right here, whenever k is an integer, it's just going to keep jumping around to negative one and one. Um, so at least for the cosine, we won't really have any issues because it's going, just going to evaluate to minus one to the k. You can confirm that for yourself. And then for this limit right here, we still have the limit as z approaches k of z minus k over sine of pi z. So z minus k over the sine of pi z. And that's a zero divided by zero situation. So we can just lop it all that to get negative one to the k and then limit as z approaches k. Derivative of the top is one 
derivative of the bottom, well, using some chain rule, that's pi times the cosine of pi z. But notice cosine of pi z in this limit right here, it's just going to be minus one to the k. So right here, we're going to get minus one to the k, one over pi times minus one to the k. These two are gonna cancel each other out, leaving us with one over pi. So what did we find out right here? We found out that the residue at z being equal to some integer of cotangent of pi z evaluates to one over pi. And um, that's quite nice, I guess. We can evaluate residues of this thing, but it doesn't help us out that much because this is a one over pi, and ideally we want a residue of one. And a residue of one is nice because at least for simple poles, if you multiply some function next to this cotangent right here, then the residue will in fact turn out to be that other function you multiplied evaluated at the pole. So we wanna get a residue of one right here somehow. And, and a nice way to fix that is just to multiply our original function by pi. So if you take the residue, um, let's just rub this out right here. If you take the residue, at z being equal to k of pi times cotangent of pi z, so I've just multiplied an extra pi into it. This is in fact going to give you, well, the extra constant times the residue of this cotangent right here, which we know is one over pi. That's just going to give us a one, which is nice. And remember, we wanted a residue of one over k squared. So what would be a nice function to take the residue of right here? Well, let's consider the function, um, pi times cotangent of pi z times one over z squared, like so. You can go through all these same steps right here. I guess I'll just do the first one. So this is equal to the limit as z approaches k of z minus k times this function. So we have a pi times the cotangent of pi z times one over z squared. But notice that this thing right here, that's exactly the residue at z equals k of pi times the cotangent of pi z. But we know that is equal to one. So in fact, this limit right here, that's, a, that's going to evaluate to one. And all that's left is the limit as z approaches k of one over z squared because we have one times one over z squared left and that's equal to one over k squared. And that's really quite nice because that's what we're after. We want a residue of one over k squared. So you can actually go through the residue calculation of this function right here. Again, using all these steps right here, it's going to be, it's going to work out quite similarly. Um, you can do that to check for yourself that it is indeed equal to one over k squared. So what did we find out right here? Let's um, rub out all of this because we don't need it anymore. We just found out that if we have our function f of z, so if f of z is equal to this right here, so pi times the cotangent of pi z times one over z squared, then the residue of our function f of z evaluated at some integer k where k isn't zero, that's going to give us one over k squared. And you can see why I emitted zero right here because if k is equal to zero, then right here, if we have a pole at zero, this isn't a first order pole anymore. It's in fact a third order pole because we have this extra um, division by z squared right here. So the simple pole formula that we use right here wouldn't work out for k being equal to zero. So that's why we're excluding zero from the integers right here. Okay, so we've successfully found a function which actually works for us, which is quite nice. So that's the end of chapter two. So let's move on to the next chapter right here, the next section. All right, so for chapter three, we're going to be taking a look at the sum of the residues. So we've figured out our function f of z, and now in this chapter, we're going to be figuring out what the sum of the residues are. So if we look back on this picture right here, we have the contour integral over Sn, and later we're going to be taking the limit as n approaches infinity on this contour integral. And we know what our function is, it's f of z right here. So f of z, dz. And the reason why we're taking the limit is, well, of course, we want this square to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I should note that the way this n is related to the square is this distance right here, it's actually defined to be n plus a half. Um, I'll explain more about this square layer in the video. But for now, if we take the limit, we're going to be catching more and more of these poles inside the contour. So this is going to be equal to 
the limit as n approaches infinity on the sum of all the residues um, inside of this contour. So this is 2 pi i times the sum and k is actually going to go from minus n to n of the residues of f of z. So this is more or less Cauchy's residue theorem. You have the contour integral being equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. So here we're going from k equals minus n which is right over here and then we're going all the way up to n as it and as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger we're going to catch more and more residues. So if we evaluate this limit on the right hand side right here we get 2 pi i times the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of the residue of our function f of z. And on the right hand side right here, later we're going to be proving that this contour integral actually goes to zero in the limit as our n approaches infinity. And that's going to simplify things quite a bit for us. And let's take a look back on the right hand side right here. k in this case is essentially all the integers because we're going from minus infinity up to infinity. So I guess we can write it like this. K is an element of the integers. But we saw from this residue calculation right here that it's only equal to 1 over k squared if, if k is an integer without zero. So let's actually exclude zero from the sum right here. And if we subtract the term that where k equals zero, we have to kind of add it back on. So this is equal to now 2 pi i times the sum for k being in the integers except for zero. This should be z equals to k and same up here, so z equals k. So the residue at z being equal to k of f of z. So here we're taking out the term where k is equal to zero. So now we just have to add it back on. So the residue at z equals zero of our function f of z. Okay, that's quite nice. And we know from what we have in chapter two, and I just realized I spelled um, chapter wrong right here. This should be an R and then a two. We know from chapter two that if K is an integer except for zero, then the residue of our function F of Z at Z equals to K, that's equal to one over K squared. So this is now two pi I times the sum K element of the integers without zero of a one over K squared plus the residue at z is equal to zero of our function f of z. Okay, and this is really quite nice right here because if you take a look, k squared is an even function, which means that if you take the branch on the negative side, so if k is less than zero, the sum will be the exact same thing as if k was positive. So let's um, rub out chapter two a little bit right here. Don't need that anymore. So now in the end, we have that the limit as n approaches infinity on the contour integral over s sub n of f of z dz, that is equal to 2 pi i times the sum, and let's actually split the sum up. I guess we'll, you can see it better if we do that. So now we have the sum um, for k element of z minus of one over k squared plus the sum again k is an element of z positive of 1 over k squared plus the residue at z being equal to 0 of our function f of z. All right, so we have this formula right here. And remember, I said that the sum on the negative integers is the same as the sum on the positive integers, because if you plug in negative numbers into the k right here, the squared kind of turns it into a positive. So essentially, what we have is two of the same sum, because this sum is really the same as this sum. So now this is equal to 2 pi i times 2 times the sum, so 2 times the sum from k element of z plus 1 over k squared plus the residue at z equals 0 of f of z. And this is in fact the Basel problem because if k is a positive integer, though k is just starting from one and it's going to infinity. So this is our Basel problem right here. And let's try to isolate that a little bit. Let's first divide everything by two pi i. So now we have um, one over two pi i times the limit as n approaches infinity on this contour integral over s sub n of f of z dz. That's equal to twice the sum plus this residue. Let's subtract this residue on the left hand side as well. So if we um, 
let's put this in parentheses, if we subtract the residue, uh, the z being equal to zero of f of z, that's going to leave us with two times the sum on the right hand side. So this is two times the sum from k equals one to infinity of one over k squared, but we want to isolate the sum because that's what we want to solve for in the Basel problem. So now we have that the sum running from k equals one to infinity of one over k squared. Let's divide everything through by two. That's going to give us one over, dividing this side by two, we're going to get four pi i times the limit as n approaches infinity. Contour integral over s sub n of f of z dz. So that's the contour integral part. So put this limit in parentheses. And then a minus one half times the residue at z being equal to zero of f of z. All right, so this is our new expression. We've found a new expression for our Basel problem, essentially. So this Basel problem is equal to this contour integral, whatever it is in the limit. Well, we know what it is because I already said it's going to go to zero. So if this thing is zero, we're going to prove that um, later in the video, then this Basel problem, the sum of one over k squared, is just equal to minus a half times this residue at the z being equal to zero, which is really quite interesting. The only thing that contributes to this sum right here is exactly the residue at the origin. All right, so I've just put what we've just derived up here. So this is quite an important result that we've just um, derived. And now we're going to be moving on to chapter four. So chapter four, that's going to be the residue at um, z being equal to zero. So residue at z equals zero of our function f of z, which I've written right here. So in this chapter, we're going to be calculating, as I said for the residue, z equals zero of our function f of z. And this is quite an interesting calculation. There's a lot of nice things involved that you'll see in a little bit, but let's just write this out first of all. This is the residue at z equals zero of pi times the cotangent of pi z over z squared, which is our function. And this pole right here, the pole at z equals zero, on this function, it's actually an ordered three pole. Because notice on this cotangent right here, that's um, cosine of pi z over the sine of pi z. This sine of pi z is the one that's causing problems, that's generating all the poles. And in fact, if you differentiate the sine, you're going to get a cosine of pi z. And if you plug z equals to zero inside this cosine, you're not going to blow up or anything. So since you've taken the first derivative on this, and the derivative of this denominator is analytic at z equals zero, that means you have a first order pole um, at least for the cotangent. And then on this one over z squared right here, you need to differentiate this thing twice in order for the point at z equals to zero to be defined at all for z squared. So in fact, this is an order two pole. You can check that for yourself because well, if you differentiate once you get two z, two z at z equals zero is still zero. And then if you differentiate this again, you're going to get two and two is not equal to zero, so that's an order two pole. And when you combine those two together, um, you get one plus two, which is three. So this is an order three pole, and that's um, quite an easy way to check for that. So if it's an order three pole, then we have to use the definition for higher order poles on this residue, and have derived this in a previous video. I'll link it in the description. But this is going to be what well, we're going to have one over n minus one factorial first of all, and n in this case is equal to three. So um, n is equal to three, because it's an order three pole. So we have this factorial term right here. Then we have the limit as z approaches zero of the um, n minus one derivative with respect to z of z minus the pole, which is zero cubed times our function f of z. And f of z is pi times the cotangent of pi z over z squared. Okay, so this is quite a nasty limit we need to evaluate, but let's just plug in all these n values right here. First of all, three minus one is two, two factorial is two, so right at the front we get one half. And then we have the limit as z approaches zero on now 
n is equal to 3, so we're just taking the second derivative, so second derivative right here, of z cubed, but notice z cubed over z squared is just z, so we have pi times z times the cotangent of pi z. Alright, and now I'm going to rewrite this a little bit, this is one half times the limit, as z approaches 0, second derivative of pi z times the cosine of pi z over the sine of pi z, and notice that this limit as it is, that's just nasty to evaluate. You got the second derivative, um, which we need to calculate on this thing, which is quite nasty already. We're not going to be taking that approach. Instead, we're going to be expanding cosine and sine into their respective Laurent series, and then we're going to be playing around with this function in that form. So let's actually rewrite sine and cosine in terms of their Taylor series. Um, so this is equal to now, um, I'll just, I guess I'll just go down the line. So this is equal to one half times the limit as z approaches zero. Second derivative of pi z. Now the cosine, that's exactly the sum. Let's choose an index um, j going from zero to infinity of minus one to the j over two j factorial. And then we have this argument, which is pi z to the 2j power. So that's the cosine Taylor series expansion. And now for the sine Taylor series expansion, it's just the sum from j equals zero to infinity of minus one to the j over 2j plus one factorial times pi z to the 2j plus one. So it's quite similar to the cosine. We just have this extra plus one in front of the 2j. Okay, so this is looking really quite nasty, um, but notice there's one subtle uh, simplification we can do, namely that we can cancel out a factor of pi z with um, a factor of pi z down here instead of the sine expansion. And notice we have this plus one right here, which is a little bit annoying, but we can actually get rid of that by dividing top and bottom by pi z. So if we divide the top by pi z, that's gone. If we divide the bottom by pi z, then that power reduces by one, which is quite nice. Okay, and where can we go from here? What I'm going to be doing next is I'm going to be doing the long division algorithm. So this, notice that this is going to give us some kind of polynomial, let's call it P. And this is also going to give us some kind of polynomial, let's call it Q. And if you take a P divided by Q, then what you're going to get is you're going to get approximately some kind of other, um, polynomial, we'll just call it R at the top right here. And um, we don't actually need to know what this R function is. We just need to know the first couple of terms because notice that we have the derivative right here as well as the limit. And if we have some kinds of polynomial, I guess I'll just call it P um, because P stands for polynomial. If we have some polynomial P of Z, for example, that's just the sum. Let's use an index, I don't know, m. So m equals zero to some order n, capital N, I guess. That's exactly, so the inside is equal to a sub n, z to the m. And this thing, you can expand it out to a zero, z to the zero is one. So next you've got a one, z one, plus a2 z2 plus dot dot dot. Um, and notice if you take the second derivative on this thing, well, the first derivative is going to give you, well, this a0 is gone, and then you're just going to be left with a1, and then here you're going to be left with two times a2 times z, and then you have higher order terms. And if you take the second derivative, so this is the first derivative, if you take the second derivative on this thing, this a1 is going to disappear, leaving you with just 2 times a2 plus, I don't know, it's probably, well, here you would have 3a2, then you would have 6a3z times z plus high order terms. But the point is, once you've taken the second derivative right here, you've reduced it down quite a bit. And on top of that, you also got this limit as z approaches zero. And what happens as z approaches zero on the second derivative right here? 
Well, notice that the constant term survives, so this 2a2 survives, but all these higher order terms, since they have a z in them, they're just going to disappear off. They're just going to vanish off to zero. So in fact, in the limits, you're just left with two times a2. So what does that tell you about the original polynomial? It tells you that only this term right here, this a2 survives, and that's the term in front of the z squared. So when we perform the long division algorithm on this quotient right here, we don't care about what the function we get out on the other end is. We only care about the coefficient in front of the z squared term, because ultimately that's the only thing that's going to survive after we differentiate twice and take this limit right here. Okay, so we know that we need to look out for the a sub 2 term, and that's the only thing we need to worry about. So, let's um, start doing the long division algorithm over here. So, I guess I'll just chuck it in over here. And let's list out the first couple of terms of both sine, sine and cosine, because that's, only what, that's really what we only need. So, the cosine is going to be in here, because we have cosine divided by sine. So, inside of this um, box symbol thing right here. Our first term for the cosine, if we plug j equals zero into everywhere, we're going to get, well, that's just going to be one. And then how about the next term? Well, we have this negative right here, so we're just alternating between plus and minus. If we plug one into here, we're going to get two factorial, which is um, two. So we get a half times pi times z raised to the second power. And then if we have the next term, that's going to be plus. Now, if j is equal to 2, we're going to get 4 factorial, which is, what is it, 24. So that's going to be plus 1 over 24 times pi z to the 4, plus dot, dot, dot. We, don't, we really need to only go up to there. And how about on this sum right here? Well, when j is equal to 0, we're going to get 1 as well. When j is equal to 1, well, this is going to be 2 times 1 plus 1, which is 3. 3 factorial is 6, so that's going to give us minus 1 sixth times pi z to the um, second power. And then if j is equal to 2, then we have a plus. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. 5 factorial is 120. So this is going to give us 1 over 120 times pi times z to the fourth power. And these numbers just keep getting bigger. And this is a good enough place to stop. So this polynomial is just going to keep going. So let's perform the long division algorithm. We want to think of something up here that such that when we divide by one, it's going to give us one. Obviously that's going to be one. So one times one is going to give us one. One times this next term, that's going to give us minus one six pi z squared, and then 1 times this term, that's going to give us plus 1 over 120 um, pi z to the fourth, like so, and then plus dot dot dot, because it keeps going. So, next we have to subtract this thing. Okay, very nice, and if we subtract that, 1 minus 1 is 0, minus a half, double negative right here, and that's going to give us, in fact, a minus a third, so this is minus pi z squared, and then right here, I'm not going to carry out the operation, that's just going to be some kind of constant c1, um, I guess, times pi z to the fourth, and it just keeps going. All right, so now we're going to take this minus one third pi z divided by one, and up here, it's going to leave us with minus one third pi z squared. So minus one third pi z squared times one, that's exactly what we have right here. So minus a third pi z squared, and minus a third times this thing, that's what, one eighteenth um, pi z to the four, because squared and squared right here. And then this just keeps going and going, and then we subtract this thing like we did at the top. We're going to get a zero and then some constant c2 times pi z to the 4 and then we just keep carrying on with this algorithm and if you keep going you're going to get some kind of constant c what are we up to c3 times pi z to the 4 plus dot 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 and just it's just going to keep growing like that and to remember what I said, we only need to worry about the um, quadratic term right here, this z squared, the term with the z squared, because that's going to be the only term that survives after we differentiate twice and take the limit. So this 
whatever power series thing is what we get after we long divide this so now we we're considering one half times the limit as z approaches zero second derivative of and this thing we know that's equal to one minus one third times pi z squared plus a high order terms i'll just do one of them so c3 times pi z to the four plus dot 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 I don't really care what the rest is because when we um, double diff this, let's get rid of this now. When we differentiate this thing twice, we're going to get what well, we have one half times the limit as z approaches zero. Dif differentiating this thing twice, this one's definitely going to disappear. So we're not going to get a one there anymore. So differentiating this thing once, we're going to get minus two th thirds um, pi squared times a z because we're bringing this squared down and this pi is already squared and differentiating this thing again well this z is going to disappear leaving us with minus two thirds times pi squared so right here we're going to have minus two thirds times pi squared and on this thing right here we're going to get plus i don't know four three to twelve z three times pi to the four z squared or something like that plus dot dot they're all going to have z's inside of them and when we take the limit right here well that's gone everything else after that is gone and what are we left with well this two and this two will cancel each other out and ultimately that ultimately that leaves us with um the limit as z approaches zero of minus pi squared over three and well that's independent of z so this is pi squared over three, and that's exactly the residue at z equals to zero of our function f of z. So chapter four is concluded because we've finally found the value of the residue at z equals zero. It's nothing other than minus pi squared over three. And that's really quite nice. And you can see this is where the value of the Basel problem really comes from. All right, so chapter four is done. I've written our result from chapter four up here. Now we're going to move on to the second last chapter. This chapter is going to be a gigantic chapter. It's going to take so long to do, but it's going to be worth it in the end. So we're going to be taking a look at the contour integral over Sn. And this is where I'm going to be kind of clarifying exactly what Sn is because I've only said that it was a swear, but let's just try to describe this swear in a little bit more detail. So, S sub n right here, n kind of refers to the size of the square, and in fact we want n to be an element of the natural numbers. So when we take the limit right here, so limits as n approaches infinity, this thing is kind of going to grow in discrete steps, so it's going to take um, kind of integer steps, so one by one at a time, and it's just going to keep going all the way up to infinity. And so let's just try to describe the square in a little bit more detail right here. I kind of mentioned briefly how n is related to the square is by this length right here. So this length is exactly n plus a half. And why is it n plus a half? Well, if you take a look at the placement of the residues, let's do, um, let's just do three for example. So one, two, three on this side, and like so. So this is z equals to zero, which is a pole, z equals one, which is a pole, z equals two is equal to a pole. And right here, we're going to have z equals to three. And notice, let's say n is equal to two. We want this path right here to cut directly in between these two poles. And we don't want it to be on the pole, otherwise we're integrating over a region that's not analytic, which isn't too good. We want it to be directly in the middle. And there's actually a nice reason for that. Um, it turns out that we're going to be taking a look at, for example, the cosine of n plus a half times pi very soon. And if n is a natural number and we're just offset by a half, so this is a half multiple of pi right here, this actually goes to zero because cosine of a half multiple of pi is um, zero, at least if n is a natural number. So that's why we ch we're choosing n plus a half as being kind of this side right here, which means that this whole entire side, you can kind of think about it as a square of side length, um, 2n plus 1. So you can think about it that way if you want to. 
So this is the path Sn, and we're going to be traversing this path in the positive direction as always. And I'm going to label each of these side lengths a little bit. So this is, let's call this gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, and gamma 4. And Sn is basically just um, the union of all these gamma and gamma i, I guess, i going from 1 to 4. It's just the union of all these side lengths right here. And we're going to be going through each of these paths one by one and taking the limit on all of those. And our ultimate goal is to show that this contour in school is equal to zero. So that's the final goal at the very end. So before I get into that, I should make one more little note. We're going to be taking a look at the corners of the square. It's going to be quite important um, to help us parameterize the square. Notice that this corner down here, it's kind of like n, my, n plus a half scaled version of one minus i. So if you're at, so if you're at, at the point one minus i, which is down here, and if you scale the square by n plus half, then it's going to take you here. Same with the corner up here. This is n plus a half. Um, let's get rid of this, times 1 plus i, this is n plus a half, times minus 1 plus i, and you get the point n plus a half, and then minus 1 minus i, like so. And that's kind of the idea. And that's going to help us parameterize all these paths right here. So let's take a look at some parameterizations over on the right hand side. That's not exactly a horizontal line as I would have liked. Let's try that again. So let's take a look at each of these paths one at a time. Let's take a look at gamma 1, um, gamma 2, gamma 3, and gamma 4. Okay, so on each of these paths right here, we can actually find a parameterization for z, because let's take a look on gamma 1 first of all. Notice that z can be written as n plus a half, and on this path right here, the only thing we're changing is the imaginary part, which is this i right here. So we can place a parameter right there, so this is exactly one plus i times t, and t is going to vary from minus one all the way up to one, okay? So you can check that for yourself. When t is equal to minus one, we're down here, and as t goes to one, we're going to be moving up this path all the way up to here. That's kind of the parameterization for gamma 1. Let's take a look at the parameterization for gamma 3 because it's going to be quite similar. Um, so z is equal to, we still have this n plus half um, scalar on the outside. And on gamma 3, the real part is negative 1. And the thing we're varying again is this imaginary part. So this is plus i t. But we want it to start from the top and go down. So which means, which means that t has to start from um, one and go down to minus one. So this is a little bit weird. We're starting from a big valley and going to a small valley. And we don't really like that. We want to kind of reorient it a little bit. So if we reorient this T such that it starts from minus one to one, we need to put a negative sign right here to kind of counteract that. So this is our new parameterization for gamma three. And notice one thing, there's two negatives in here. Let's factor that out to the front, so this is a negative out here. So that's going to change all of these inside to a positive. And notice one cool thing. This parameterization is basically the negative version of the parameterization for gamma one. So in fact, what we can do right here, we can combine both the gamma one and gamma three together um, and say that this is equal to, our z is equal to plus or minus this thing right here. And we can actually do the same thing for gamma two and gamma four as well. And, and that's going to help us out quite a bit because instead of calculating four in schools, we're just calculating two integrals. So that's really quite nice. So gamma three is kind of taken care of with gamma one. And now let's take a look at gamma two. So gamma two, all the points Z can be written as, well, we're fixing the imaginary part. So we have N plus a half on the top. We're fixing the imaginary part, so we definitely have a plus i, but we're varying the real part. So we have some kind of parameter t on the real part right here, and we want t to go from um, one to minus one. So here t is going from um, 
one to minus one. Bit of a weird orientation like before. So that's the parameterization for gamma two. Similarly for gamma four, we have the scalar multiple and plus a half. And then we have a T minus I because we're fixing the imaginary part um, on the negative region. And here we want to traverse this way. So from left to right. So which means that T is going to go from minus one to one. Okay, and just like we did before, let's try to fix the orientation right here. So if we switch these around, so we're going from minus one to one now. If we're switching the orientation of our t, we need to introduce a negative sign right here. But on gamma two, we can factor out a negative in this factor. So if we factor out a negative right here, we're going to multiply a negative in here and a negative in here in order to counteract that. But notice, this is basically the same as what we have for gamma four. So in fact, we can combine these two parameterizations together, say that gamma two and gamma four, we can consider plus or minus whatever we have right here. And T is going from minus one to one. So those are our parameterizations actually, which is really quite nice. And now we can start evaluating a couple of these integrals. So um, let's get rid of this picture probably don't need it anymore, but um, let's take a look right here. We want to calculate the integral over gamma one and gamma three of our function f of z, which is pi times the cotangent of pi z over z squared dz. And we wanna show that this goes to zero. So we want to kind of estimate this, find an upper bound for it, and show that in the limit, it goes to zero. So let's take absolute values of this thing right here. And we can use the parameterization for gamma one and gamma three um, to say that this integral is equal to the absolute value of the integral from minus one to one. So T is our parameter, it's going from minus one all the way up to one. And now we have pi times the cotangent of pi times z, but z is equal to plus or minus n plus a half times one plus i t over, uh, I'm just going to leave it as z squared actually, you'll see why later. And I actually forgot to calculate the differential. So dz is equal to just the constant multiple outside of the t. So plus or minus n plus a half times i times dt. And down here as well, dz is equal to plus or minus n plus a half um, dt. Um, I kind of ran out of space. Let's actually move everything to the bottom right here. Um, I don't want to swish everything in. DZ is exactly equal to um, plus or minus N plus a half. And then we have our DT like so. Okay, so now we're dealing with a real variable, which means we can use the integral inequality to say that this is less than or equal to the integral of the inequality. And I'm going to do a couple things at the same time. I'm going to pull out this pi, which is a constant. And I'm going to pull out this n plus half, which is also a constant. So now we have on the outside pi times n plus a half. And then we're going to move the inequalities inside of the integral. So now we have the integral from minus one to one. And then absolute value of this cotangent right here. But notice that this, this should have been a plus or minus. So this plus or minus, since cotangent is a odd function, we can pull that plus or minus out to the outside. So we have plus or minus the cotangent of pi times n plus a half times one plus i t. And then this is over z squared. And now absolute value of plus or minus, that's exactly just one. So we can ignore that. Absolute value of i is exactly one. So we can ignore that as well. And we've already dealt with this n plus a half. So now we just have our dt on the very ends. Okay, that's quite nice. And of course, this plus and minus disappears because we're inside the absolute value. And of course, we can split the absolute value on the top in the denominator as well. So this is absolute value of z squared. But the absolute value of z squared is the same thing as the absolute value of z, but the whole thing squared. So we can write it like that. And the reason why I left it as z squared is actually because we can do a further approximation. So if we look back on the circle on the square again, notice that the absolute value of a z is just the distance between every single point on the square on the origin. And notice if we construct a circle inside of here, 
This circle will have a radius of n plus a half because remember this distance I described on the square was n plus a half, so the radius of the circle is n plus a half. And this turns and this circle turns out to be just the absolute value of z. So the absolute value of z is equal to n plus a half. And notice that the modulus of every single point on the square is greater than n plus a half. So the absolute value of z on the square. So absolute value of z on the square, um, say on s sub n, is actually greater than or equal to n plus a half. And well, right here we have 1 over z squared, so if we take the reciprocal on both sides and swear it, so absolute value of z squared. If we take the reciprocal, we're flipping the inequality, so we have 1 over n plus a half squared like so. Okay, that's quite nice. And notice we just have this cotangent function multiplied on the top. So if we multiply both sides by this cotangent function, we get that what we have at the moment, so cotangent over the absolute value of z squared, that's less than or equal to the cotangent over n plus a half squared. So that's a further estimation we can do on this integral. And while I'm at it, I might as well call um, this pi times n plus a half, I might as well call that lambda. And notice that lambda can take on the values. Well, if you just plug in integer values for n, lambda can be pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, and so on. All right, so let's write that integral down. So this is less than or equal to, we showed that it's equal to pi times n plus a half integral from minus one to one, absolute value of this cotangent. And well, that thing right there, we've said that was pi, um, lambda as a simplification, then one plus i times t. And this is over n plus a half, but the whole thing squared. Okay, now we can drag this out to the outside. So now this is equal to, notice that this factor will cancel with one of these factors down here. So we have pi over n plus a half, times the integral from minus one to one of the absolute value. And I'm going to rewrite this cotangent in terms of cosines and sines. So we have cosine, let's expand out this inside as well. So we have lambda plus i times lambda t over the sine of lambda plus i of lambda t, like so, and t. And now where can we go from here? Notice that we have the cosine of some addition and sine of some additions. We can use their respective angular addition formula to further evaluate this integral. So let's just do that. Let's try to fit it down here actually. So now this integral, we can write this as, well, we still have this pi over n plus a half hanging out the front. Now we have the integral from minus one to one of the absolute value of now if we use the angular addition formula for cosine we have cosine of the first angle cosine of the second angle and then since we have addition right here we have a minus right here so this is sine of the first angle sine of the second angle so that's um the cosine done and now for the sine we have the sine of the first angle cosine of the second angle plus the cosine of the first angle and then sine of the second angle and absolute value dt. Okay, that's quite nice. We've done the angular addition, whatever. And now notice one cool thing right here. Cosine of lambda, well, lambda is all these values right here. And if you look on the unit circle, um, lambda hits all these points right here where x equals zero and the cosine of all these points since x is equal to zero that means the cosine of lambda is always equal to um, zero and that's why we chose the square so that it passes halfway in between those poles it's exactly for this reason right here so cosine becomes zero which means all of this goes to zero same thing down here actually which is quite nice and that's going to leave us with this sine stuff and this other trigonometric stuff down here. But notice they both have sines inside of them. So the sines cancel out. And this negative also cancels out because it's inside of the absolute value. So a whole heap of cancellations happen. And we're left with pi 
over n plus a half times the integral from minus 1 to 1 of the absolute value of the sine of i times lambda t over the cosine of i lambda t absolute value dt. All right, this is really quite nice right here. We've simplified everything down quite a bit and we can actually keep going. Notice that we have i's inside of these sines and cosines and we can actually use some hyperbolic trig identities to get rid of these i's right here. So for the sine, if we want to get rid of this i right here, we have to turn the sine into a singe. But not only that, if we're dealing with sines, we get an extra factor of i out the front. So this is i times the singe, so we've pulled out this i, and now we have to turn the sine into a singe of lambda t, so now that i is gone, this is over, same deal for cosine right here, if we pull out this sine, we have to turn the cosine into a cosh, and we don't have an extra factor of i out unlike sine, so we can just leave it as it is, of lambda t like so, dt, absolute value of i is 1, so that can disappear, and now we have the sine over cosh, and that's exactly tangent, so now we have pi over n plus a half, integral from minus 1 to 1, of the absolute value of the tang of pi t, not pi t, lambda t, dt. So what did we show right here? Notice that this integral, we said it was less than some other integral, which was less than this integral, which actually evaluates to this thing. So in fact, what we have right here, this integral that we started off with, its absolute value is less than or equal to pi over n plus a half integral from minus one to one absolute value of tang of, of pi t dt. And in fact, this integral we can I mean, you can evaluate it if you want to. It's going to evaluate to some finite value. Um, so this whole entire thing is a finite, which means that when n approaches infinity, it's actually going to go to zero. But let's actually show that in an, a bit of a nicer way by using some more estimations. And we're going to be estimating on our tang. So now how can we estimate our tangent function? Notice that this is the absolute value of tangent, and if you look at the graph of that function, it looks a little bit like this. And actually asymptotes out to, well, if this is the y-axis, you're going to get y equals one as the asymptote. This is the t-axis if you want. Notice that for the interval minus one to one, or even if you consider the whole real numbers, the absolute value of a tangent of lambda t is less than one, like so. So in fact, if this is less than or equal to one, then that means we can do a little bit of a replacement on the integral and say that this integral is less than, strictly less than, pi over n plus a half times the integral from minus one to one. And now we just replace absolute value of tang with the function one dt, like so, and this is really easy to evaluate, we just take the length of this interval, which is 2, so this is 2 pi over n plus a half. So we found a further estimation for this interval, we found that the absolute value of the integral over gamma 1 or gamma 3 is less than 2 pi over n plus a half, so let's actually write it down right here, let's get rid of this thing. This in, is in fact a less than and 2 pi over n plus a half. And you can have an equal sign there if you want to. Um, really doesn't matter because you can clearly see that as n approaches infinity, this thing's going to go off to zero. And let's actually do this. Um, if we take the limit everywhere, and let's actually try to use some squeeze theorem, um, just for fun. Notice that this value right here is strictly positive, so greater than zero. So in fact, we can squeeze this integral um, between two bounds, so we have zero as a bound. And you know it's less than or equal to this absolute value of the integral, um, gamma one, gamma three. And the reason why it's greater than zero is because well, it's an absolute value, so it's always positive. So integral over gamma one or gamma three, and that's less than or equal to two pi over n plus a half. And well, if we take the limit everywhere, well, the limit of zero is zero. So remember, we want n to approach infinity because we want to capture all the poles. So the limit of zero is zero. That's less than or equal to the limit as n approaches infinity 
on the absolute value of this integral right here. That's less than or equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of two pi over n plus a half. This thing's clearly going to go to zero. This thing is also zero, which means that this integral in the limit is squeezed between zero and zero, which means it must be equal to zero by the squeeze theorem. So therefore in the ends, we have that the limit as n approaches infinity on the absolute value of the integral um, over gamma one or gamma three is equal to zero by the squeeze theorem. And so what does that say about the integral itself? Well, the only way for the absolute value of something to be equal to zero is if that something is equal to zero itself. So we've just shown that the limit as n approaches infinity on the absolute value over gamma one or gamma three is equal to zero and that's quite nice and that's well basically what we just did so let's add that to our results so the integral over gamma one or three goes to zero so we've proven for two of the integrals on the square at least that it goes to zero let's go to the next two integrals which is gamma two and gamma four so let's take a look at the absolute value of the integral over gamma two and gamma four. And we're gonna use this parameterization we have already over here, which is quite nice. So this is equal to now the integral, or absolute value of the integral from t equals minus one to one of pi times the cotangent of pi times z, which is exactly plus or minus out here. And then we have n plus a half t minus i and then all this divided through by just like before i'm going to keep it as z squared and then zz becomes plus or minus n plus a half and then we have our dt like so ends of absolute value okay and just like before i'm going to call this pi times n plus a half thing right here lambda just so things are a little bit nicer to write so let's um Let's see what we can do. Just like before, let's bring up this pi, let's bring up this n plus a half. So this is now equal to pi times n plus a half. And of course I should use the integral inequality as well. So bringing the absolute values inside of the integral. So now we have the integral from minus one to one of the absolute value of cotangent of plus or minus. So again, this plus or minus can jump out to the outside because cotangent is an odd function. And that plus or minus just dies inside of the absolute value. So there's no point in writing it. So lambda and then t minus i like so. And this is over z squared. And just like before, we can split up the absolute value into numerator and denominator. And then on the denominator, we actually get again the absolute value of z squared and just like before we can do another approximation right here or estimation this is going to turn into n plus a half but the whole thing squared and we can bring that out to the outside as well it's going to give us pi over well this n plus a half is going to cancel out with a factor right there so we're just going to left with, be left with n plus a half on the denominator then we still have the integral from minus one to one of the absolute value. Let's rewrite the cotangent a little bit, just like before. So we have cosine of expanding out this argument. We're going to get pi times t minus i lambda over the sine of the lambda t minus i lambda, absolute value dt. And now we're going to be using the angular sum identities again. So this is equal to pi over n plus a half of um, the integral from minus one to one. Let's see if I can fit it in here even. Let's see, we have the absolute value for cosine, it's going to be cosine of angle one, cosine of angle two. And since we have a minus right here, we have a plus. So now we have the sine of angle one and sine of angle two. This is divided through by um, the sine. So let's expand that out. This is sine of angle one cosine of angle two. And since we have a minus, we need a minus right here. And then we have cosine of angle one and then sine of angle two, absolute value dt. And similarly to before, we can use some hyperbolic trig identities to get rid of this i right here. So this is equal to now. We can actually do that on 
all four of these terms, which is quite nice. So we have pi over n plus a half integral from minus one to one of the absolute value of the cosine of lambda t. And for this cosine right here, we can get rid of this i, but we have to turn this cosine into a cosh. So we have a cosh of um, lambda. And then over here, we have a plus a sine of lambda t. And then to, we can pull out the i inside of the sine by turning it into a singe of lambda. And then if, if we're dealing with sine, we have to put in an i. And then on the bottom, we have the sine of lambda t and then cosh of lambda because we're taking out that i and then minus cosine of lambda t. And then for the sine right here, if we pull out an i, we have to turn it into a singe and introduce a new i. So now we have a singe of the lambda. All right, so that's quite nice. And now notice we can split up the absolute values um, for the numerator and the denominator. And what we can actually do from here, let's actually calculate the absolute values of each of these complex numbers because we nicely have it in the form real part plus i times imaginary part for both the top and the bottom. All right, so if we have complex numbers on the top and the bottom right here in the form a plus ib, and if we take the modulus of that thing, that's just going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared. So just some basic complex number stuff right there. So let's carry out the operation. We're going to get pi over n plus a half integral from minus one to one. So the modulus of the top right here, we're literally just going to swear everything except for this i. So we're going to have cosine squared lambda t cosh squared lambda. And then we're going to have the plus. This i is going to drop out because it's the imaginary number i, which doesn't contribute to this. Um, so we're going to have a sine squared lambda t and then a singe squared lambda. So that's the top um, or the numerator done. And let's figure out the modulus of the denominator. That's going to be the sine squared of lambda t and cosh squared of lambda. And then this minus disappears because when you swear a minus, it becomes positive. So this is going to be plus the cos squared of lambda t. And then we have a singe squared of lambda dt. And then of course I forgot to swear it on both of these. So we have a swear it up there and swear it in the denominator. But if we have a swear it divided by swear it, we can kind of combine it into one big swear it. So now we have a giant swear root of this whole entire thing. And um, this looks more scarier than what we had, but it's actually more useful in this form. And you'll see in a short moment, but now let's try to clean things up a little bit. We have all this hyperbolic stuff lying around everywhere, which we don't really want. So let's try to get rid of these koshes right here. You could get rid of the singes, but it's actually a little bit nicer if we remove the koshes. And the way we're going to do that is, is just by dividing the top and bottom by kosh squared. So this is now equal to pi over n plus a half, integral from minus one to one, square root of, now if we divide the top by kosh, we're going to be left with cosine squared of lambda t. And then we have a plus. Now if we divide the kosh on this second term right here, well, singe over kosh is tange. So we're going to have the singe uh, or sine squared lambda t and then tange squared of lambda and then on the bottom we're also going to be dividing by cosh squared so we're going to be left with sine squared of lambda t cosh squared is going to disappear and then we're going to have plus cosine squared of lambda t and then sine divided singe divided by cosh is tange so we're going to have this tange squared of lambda and then on dt like so. All right, so this is a very nice right here because in fact, tange is a bounded function, um, just like we saw on the other integrals. So now what I'm going to do, notice that, well, notice that this integral that we started off with is less than what we have here currently. So if we take the limit as n approaches infinity on both of those, so if we have the limits as n approaches infinity on the absolute value of integral over gamma two and four. That's going to be less than or equal to the limit 
as n approaches infinity on what we have over here, which is a pi over n plus a half. And I'm going to split the limit up a little bit. So we're going to have the limits as n approaches infinity of this integral from minus one to one. But what you can actually do is you can put this limit inside of this integral and you can justify that by using the dominated convergence theorem. Um, we can show that there's an upper bound for this square root function right here. You can even check on Desmos and just choose some random upper bounds like 10 and that actually bounds this whole entire function. So in fact this limit you can't justify the interchange between integral and limit. So if you do that interchange right there, you're going to be left with the integral from minus one to one, limit as n approaches infinity on the square root, but you can interchange the square root and the limit, and you're going to be left with the square root of the limit as n approaches infinity of whatever is inside. But notice that lambda is just equal to pi times n plus a half. And as n approaches infinity, lambda also approaches infinity. So you could also consider the limit as lambda approaches infinity if you want to. And what you're going to find is that the tangents right here turn into one because as tangent of something that's bigger and bigger and bigger, you're just going to be approaching one. So in fact, in the limit, these tangents disappear and you're going to be left with cosine squared of lambda t plus a sine squared of lambda t over the sine squared of lambda t plus the cosine squared of lambda t and notice that's just some Pythagorean theorems right there so cosine squared plus sine squared is one so that's one sine squared plus cosine squared that's also one so that's one so you're left with the square root of one divided by one which is one and overall, you're just going to be left with the limit as n approaches infinity. So I guess I'll just write it down over here. So the limit as n approaches infinity of pi over n plus a half. And then this is just the integral of one from minus one to one, which is just two. So you can have a two out there if you want to. And if you evaluate this limit right here, you can use some squeeze theorem just like before. Um, it's going to go to zero. So this integral, it's bounded below by zero, bounded above by zero. So in fact, in the limit, this integral has to go to zero. So we've concluded that the limit as n approaches infinity on the absolute value of the integral of gamma two or gamma four um, is equal to zero. And that implies that the limit of the integral it itself goes to zero. So that's our final integral. We've shown that the integral over gamma 2 and gamma 4 goes to 0. And both of these results combined therefore give that the contour integral over s sub n is equal to 0 because s sub n is just the union of all these paths right here. And since they're equal to 0, that means the whole entire contour is equal to zero. All right, so we are done with chapter five. That was an incredibly long chapter. And now on to chapter six. And chapter six is the grand finale. Uh, that's not how you write an F, grand finale. So we've shown all of these results right here and we have this equation, um, which is kind of a representation for our Basel problem. So now we have the sum running from k equals one to infinity of one over k squared. That's our Basel problem. That's exactly one over four pi i times the limit as n approaches infinity of the contour integral over s sub n. But we know that the contour integral in the limit goes to zero. I really should put an arrow there. So we know that in the limit, this integral goes to zero. So that's convenient. And then we have minus one half. And then the residue at z equals zero of our function f of z is minus pi squared over three. So minus pi squared over three. Okay, so this goes to zero, that's quite nice. And this thing right here, minus and minus is positive. And then we have pi squared over six. So in the end, we have that the sum running from k equals one to infinity of one over k squared is equal to pi squared over six. And thus we have 
solve the basal problem using complex analysis. That is the final result for, the t for today's video. This video has gone on for way too long, but I'm glad we gotten through it. Um, it was definitely worth it. So that is pretty much it for this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you did, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on more content like this. But uh, yeah, until next time, have yourselves a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.